board meeting school for 2020-2021 school year. Let's all please rise for one year. Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting is a meeting of the school board in public for the purpose of conducting school corporation business. It is not to be considered a public community meeting. There will be time for public participation as indicated on the agenda. Uh, all board members were provided with the background information of the various items on the agenda in preparation of the meeting. And we do have public comment forms over here. If anyone would like to address the board at the appropriate time, you can grab one of those forms, fill it out, and return it to the board table, and we'll bring you up at the uh, part of the meeting for that. Okay. We'll start off with our new business, which is our recommendation and rollout plan of back to school for 2020-2021 school year. Dr. Allen. Thank you. Attached here, you will find uh, the presentation to provide the board the detailed information about our return to school plan. Um, as you're aware, August 12th is set to be the first day of school for our students and our school year employees as far as when we're receiving our students back into the district. A few items I want to mention regarding this plan itself. Um, you will see we need to define a new normal. Um, we are not unique to this as we're all aware and we need to enact additional precautions within the district that allow for safety and health to be of absolute priority. Um, in our in our school community. I shared with you here the quote from Dr. Box. She was obviously very involved as the Indiana State Health Commissioner in the development of plans throughout the state of Indiana. And she is specifically stating that in any way, shape, or form that we can return students to school, even if in modified form, we need to do this. It is not only a priority for their educational development, but also as we all know here, their physical and their social well-being and their mental well-being. The board is aware that there has been a lot of background into the development of this plan. It is research-based and focused on the health and safety of our school community. And I wanna thank various internal and external stakeholder groups for their feedback and considerations and of course all of you as we've had a work session on this as well. Um, our school board of trustees has been instrumental in the development of this plan. Our parents and employees have completed the survey that allowed us for additional feedback to finalize the development of the plan. Um, I want to just strictly mention as well that there were um, some concerns when we did not put out our feedback survey as soon as some districts did. And I will tell you that that was very strategic. I had asked the team um, led by Dr. Stevens and in coordination with Mrs. Williams and Mr. DePasquale to um, hold off on releasing that feedback survey because I felt that having the feedback um, at the most real time of us developing the final portions of the plan was more beneficial to us than having a survey with results that were six to eight weeks old. Um, we've also worked closely, as you know, with Governor Holcomb's office and the executive orders that he's put in place and Dr. McCormick from the um, Indiana State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Dr. Box. I want to personally thank as well Dr. Stamp with the Porter County Health Department as she came and met with us as Porter County Superintendents. And as you're aware, I oversee um, the, the superintendents as the president of that group and I'm very proud of our collaborative efforts. Um, and also the president that I sit currently as the Northwest Indiana Superintendent Study Council president and worked closely to help them as well um, as we worked with the Lake County Porter, excuse me, the Lake County physician as well. I think it's important always to look at what those survey results are because they tell us a lot about where we're headed and why we're headed there. 
and also incorporates into our plan feedback from the various stakeholders so that we can make sure we look at this from a very broad lens um, and not just from the recommendations at the uh, official level of the health department, but also what works best for our community. I think it's important to mention here that nearly 2,000 uh, parents took this survey and it should be also mentioned that when 2,000 individuals took the survey, they represent oftentimes more than just one student from Portage Township Schools, sometimes two students, three students, five students. So our response was very high, and I anticipated that because we have a very engaged parent community. Um, it breaks down here for you, each of the school level, and again, even if you look at our high school, nearly 800 surveys were completed for the high school. Of course, when you see um, Sailor and South Haven at 104 and 114, they are our smaller school communities. So it wasn't that they did not have as much engagement, they just have a smaller um, base of families there. A few things just to toot our own horn in the district because um, I know the board has been very complimentary about what occurred last spring. And our parents very clearly appreciate the efforts of the school community as well. Our teachers did a phenomenal job during the time that we were shut down this spring, as did our other um, school departments. So communication from the school district and administration, you see that the green bar of being excellent and the yellow bar of being average, I take those both as wins. Uh, our families really felt like we communicated with them in a, in a time that we all know was unprecedented and something that none of us had ever experienced before, nor did we have much time to prepare. The communication from teachers, um, it is the highest bar there for excellence, and I can't commend our teachers enough for all that they did to keep families informed and students engaged. Technology support, again, was something that was ongoing and something I appreciate. Help desks were put into place. Um, I know that our IT team delivered devices when devices weren't working for students. Um, so I can't thank them enough as well. Again, they were under pressure to get out a plan, and they did it and did it very well. And as we all know, our food service, the, the serving of our meals has, has been a staple in the community in a time of need. And as you're well aware, that morning we went out of school and the following Monday, so we went out on a Thursday or Friday, I can't recall, and that following Monday we had 10,000 meals prepared and I sent you some screenshots of all of those meals in the, in the um, coolers and that was coming from all kitchens throughout the district. So our families noticed and I think that's to be celebrated. Do we feel our student was actively engaged during this process? And again, this is from the parent perspective. And I think they were really honest here. Sometimes the answer was just no. Um, and if you look, the strong majority was sometimes. Again, another reason why it's really imperative that we get our kids back into school. I myself, as a mom of two Portage kids, can tell you I appreciate their teachers. Um, having two educators at home, trying to work with a 10-year-old and a nearly 14-year-old. Um, I would rather their ed educators who educated them on a daily basis and kept them organized and, and in a routine, they did a much better job for us than, than my husband and I were able to do at home. And I think that's reflected here in the results as well. Our e-learning experience, again, exceeding expectations, above average and average. Our families really felt like the dedication and the importance and relevance of the lessons and the responsibility that our teachers took very seriously to provide quality education for our kids at a distance remained. So I appreciate that feedback and I know you do as well. And our overall experience with the e-learning process from the parent perspective, if you look at those average bars and the excellent bars, and we, we did really do a good job for our students. But what we know is that there's nothing that compares to the live instruction with a certified educator and caring adults around you who build relationships, help make sure your overall well-being is, is met and your parents can do what they do during the normal workday um, and not have to educate their child at home. So now we're gonna get into some of the results that the parents provided us. Uh, about their input for the fall. You can see here about how concerned families are for returning this fall. They are concerned, as are all of you, as are 
um, our internal team as well. And they did specifically give us some input on what matters to them and what preventative measures they feel need to be in place. And of course, this also helped me to determine what pieces needed to be highly communicated to them to help um, kind of calm everyone's thoughts as we are in this time of uncertainty. So they definitely felt that daily screening of symptoms was important. Uh, face coverings, as you know, this is no surprise to anyone, that's kind of all over the place. Social distancing and limiting interactions between their peers and collaborating in small groups was not so much as, as a concern either. But if you see that green critical piece at the very end of the chart, that is the additional protocols for cleaning and sanitizing. And so our parents want to know what we're going to do to, to avoid the spread of this illness when our kids are back in the classroom. And they understand the touch points, they understand um, the importance of hygiene, all of that, but they wanna know what we're gonna do. When we're talking about masks, um, there was various feedback about mask wearing, uh, if they're recommended and, and not required, would our students wear them? And the families did say that approximately half would still have their kids wear them and the other half would not necessarily do so. I will tell you that when we talked about this at the Porter County meeting with Dr. Stamp and her team, we asked what, what should we know as we develop our plans at the district level about the, the masks? And she said, I will tell you this, when masks are not required, they drastically decline in their use. And so if you plan to return to school and you want to eliminate a wide spread of cases, your students and staff need to be masked when they can't be socially distant. Um, so again, that was the recommendation, which we took very seriously across the county, of course. And I will tell you that everyone is on board across the county that masks when we cannot be socially distant is going to be a requirement. Um, and then also, if they were mandatory, would you still send your child to school? And it almost went up to about 70% that they still would send their child. And we know um, nationally, the average of individuals who aren't necessarily wanting to send their children to school is about 30% if masks are required. We're right there in the average that other superintendents across the nation are seeing. Just some additional input from parents. Um, I want to specifically share with you, when you see the, the two interesting pieces that I found in this data here is if they're required to wear PPE, so if they're required to wear a mask, um, you know, there are some that are strongly opposed to that. And I would consider those kind of the, in the, the category of strongly opposed one and two. But more than that, they're strongly pro opposed against a virtual model. And so when I looked at this feedback, I, I looked at this from the standpoint of, again, this is where we look to our health professionals to say, okay, you can't have the best of both worlds. What's it gonna be, folks? So if we're doing traditional, any child, as also any staff that is returning, will need to utilize the mask when it's appropriate and when social distancing cannot be obtained. Um, for students who uh, their parents do not elect for them to be wearing a mask, or a physician has stated that um, a mask is not going to be worn by that child, that child will be virtual. And that's a very strong statement, but something that in order to get our students back to school, we need to remain committed to. Some additional feedback to share with you. Of course, they just wanted to know the plan for returning, and um, they're in they're definitely right along with all of us, wanting to just know what are we planning for. They want safety to be the first and, and utmost priority. Um, they want to make sure that if there's virtual learning, that there's additional time to complete that learning. Could we get some things a week in advance? Um, now that we'll have a little more time to prepare for that, I think that's a reasonable expectation. They want to have consistency so that they can best um, plan for their childcare. And also, um, they did have concerns that if there were an adjusted calendar, that it would be difficult for them to plan for childcare in the later months. So that in the event that we might have to have an intermittent shutdown here or there because of cases, and then if we did go strictly out for those few months in the winter, they had concerns about their leave time from work. That was uh, in the narrative portion of the comments. 
Any questions on parent results? One question. If uh, you can go back to one of the survey questions, and it's more curiosity than anything. Some parents, the question is, how concerned are you about your students returning to school this fall? It seems like we have a decline in the number of parents responding to that particular question. Um, when you look at the next question, it's about over 1,000, whereas with this question, it's only 600. So we didn't get a lot of feedback. I'm assuming on that question. That's correct. Okay. That is to correct. Make sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that was mentioned as well in some of the comments was that they, they're, at, and I'm glad you mentioned this, there were some parents that said it really depended on my individual child. I may not be as concerned for this particular child in my household, but there's another child that may be medically fragile. And so they felt like that overall general response didn't fit their needs to be able to respond. So they ended up putting in the narrative you know, Johnny, I'm completely comfortable with returning, but Susie, I've got concerns. Thank you. So going into the employee results, again, we did get a significant amount of, of employees that completed the survey, nearly 800 out of our 1,400 employees. Um, and I think it's important to mention that obviously we got them from various departments, and it was important to me that we took the input of our employees from all various groups. And they also had a portion to complete a narrative. And I'll tell you overall, the, the resounding thought was whatever we need to do to get our kids back, we're up for it. Um, and that was from all employee groups. They missed the kids. The way that we had to end the school year without a conclusion was just hard on our students, on our families, and our employees. So as far as returning to work, um, they are concerned, but if you notice, they don't say, I'm not going to return. There was not a single one that said that from these results. Um, but again, if you look, it's trending in the same uh, way that the parent results did. They want to know what we're putting in place to keep everyone safe and healthy. Also, if face coverings are recommended but not required, we know 70% said they, st they still plan to wear them. Um, and if they were not required, would you return to work? And I think it's important to note again, the <coughs> responsibility is to our students and our employees. There's nearly, you know, 16% there that wouldn't feel comfortable if in some way, shape or form, face coverings weren't required at this time. Additional employee input here. Um, I noted that the hybrid model, um, and the virtual model, teachers really expressed a significant amount of increased preparation and work that it takes when they're preparing the hybrid. That's really difficult, but they understand that we have to do it under the circumstances of right now, we have to limit the number in the building we're going to be in the yellow range. The virtual model with no in-person instruction, um, you know, nearly 40% of our, of our employees just felt like that's we shouldn't just go there without making efforts to try to get our kids back in some way, shape, or form. And again, it is in alignment with, Dr. with what Dr. Box is saying as well. Um, the adjusted calendar, that was kind of widespread across um, the employee groups, but there were several comments about their own children and child care. But I'll tell you that that was the same for child care concerns, even when we have to go out on an intermittent um, you know, virtual situation. They, again, are eager to learn what we're going to do. They are concerned about child care. Um, they did have questions, if we adjust the calendar in the winter, will other districts in the county do the same? Um, I did get some feedback from my uh, Porter County colleagues, and at this time, they're not looking to adjust the winter calendar. Uh, Mr. Franks, who, by the way, was just named the CTE principal for the Career Center, who happens to be right here, one of our longtime teachers. Um, Congratulations. Yes. So I will tell you as far as the Career Center is concerned and our special education services are concerned, us going on a revised calendar and the others not becomes difficult for our students. So at this point in time, uh, it wasn't part of what my recommendations are, but I think just like with everything, we have to be understanding and flexible that that may become something we do but uh, currently it's not what's developed in the plan. 
And additional concerns were expressed. I'm sure you've seen the videos of younger students keeping their hands off their masks and out of their mouths and not switching because yours is cooler than mine. Um, and then those additional precautions in environments such as the bus and how we're going to serve food and passing periods. Any questions on the employee feedback? So going into the guiding principles and goals and our future actions here. Can I sure. back you up? On the employee feedback, did you break that down by elementary? I mean, were the responses where you maybe look at what the elementary responses are from the teachers? Let me take a look. Versus the middle school or the I high school? I think it just said teachers. Just, oh, okay. I, I would imagine it probably vary. Yes, yes, because definitely it was, you could tell it was our elementary teachers who were most concerned about, the, had most concerns about the, the uh, hygiene of utilizing the mask. But then our secondary teachers had concerns about the compliance of utilizing the mask. So again, all things we have to think about and then providing that feedback allows us to do. I know um, you said that all the staff said that they would return. I'm wondering how staff that is probably older, over the age of 60, or in some cases even older, how were they all feeling about this? They didn't express it. Well, there were, there were some individuals who had expressed, um, not only in the, the question where it said, would you return if they weren't required, and we had about 16, 17% that said they wouldn't. Uh, several of them, I can't say a lot, but several did add in the in the lower portion that if masks weren't in some way, shape, or form required, that they didn't feel due to their health conditions and or someone that they're caring for or their spouse, that they would be able to return if in some way, shape, or form it wasn't going to be something we required. So although we didn't have a real clear picture of exactly who those folks were, there was definitely, you know, I, I've been I've been driving this bus for 30 years and I want to return. However, if kids aren't wearing a mask on the bus. I'm not confident that I should return based on my health conditions. So when we looked at developing our plan, we wanted to, of course, make sure health and safety was the top priority, that we are looking out to being committed to the social, emotional, and mental well-being of our students, faculty and families and staff, um, equity of access to make sure that our students um, have the opportunity to remain engaged because we have to plan and assume that intermittent uh, virtual learning is going to occur. Um, I will tell you that Mrs. Williams is working on that currently with some connectivity, with grants, um, MIFIs and different things. So there are dollars coming out and that is our focus for um, securing those dollars for our kids is to make sure they have connectivity. We already provide the devices and we'll continue to do so. Um, making sure that the high quality standard based instruction is focused on um, no matter the setting we return and how we have to move and transition between those levels, that we're flexible and creative, that we're responsible in our plans, that they're feasible, that they're effective, and that they're fiscally responsible, as I know that that's a priority of the board as well, making sure that these plans are able to be effective, yet maximizing our personnel, maximizing our programs, um, our technology, all of our equipment, and various other things. Also making sure that we communicate, and it's open, it's transparent, and it's timely. I know the board had suggested during our work session that you'd like weekly updates about, you know, where are we with things, and have we had cases and all of that? Of course, we would follow all of those confidential guidelines to do so. But I think we need to also develop, as you've mentioned, a way that will also communicate that ongoing with families. So what information is pertinent to share that people feel like we are being transparent and open? What reminders do we need to provide? Um, you know, we're noticing an increase of students who might need their masks washed or whatever that may be. So um, some of that will be tailored at the individual building level, but then of course, district-wide will be communicating as well. And then being committed to recognizing the interconnected connectedness and impact of our community. So we know that, that parents have definitely expressed they need to get back to work, but they want their kids to return to school safely. So how can we accomplish both? 
the goals of reentry. So our top priority is keeping our students and employees safe. And I've said that several times and you'll hear me say it several times more because it is truly what means the most in developing a plan. We want to reopen our schools with possible conditions and scenarios considered. We didn't have time to plan before, but we surely have time to plan now. When we met with Dr. Stamp, she had shared with us when we went out in March, and all of us agreed collectively across the county superintendents that that was the right thing to do. We did not have one confirmed case yet. Now we have the data and how we move and what scenarios we plan for will allow us to be responsive to that data, but keep our kids in school as long as it is safe. Um, preparing for sudden closures, we have to be prepared for that in coordination with our state and local health officials and again, creating that equitable learning environment for our kids. Any questions there? Okay, so what does back to school look like? I wanted to take this approach from a very broad-based level. We needed to consider the teaching and learning environment, what protective measures, cleaning and sanitizing, vulnerable populations of students and employees, transporting our kids, what do meals look like, what about extracurriculars. Um, we had to think through it all and we had to be able to give enough information and I was glad to see that families really just wanted to know what we're doing to keep kids safe because that's really how we had developed this to begin with, to communicate those things real clearly and give them actions that, that we can ensure are taking place. So how do we address the community spread in Portage Township schools? This became really interesting when we met with Dr. Stan because she said to us, we need to consider the difference between a community spread and a case spread. So in a school building, if there is a case spread, students that either have symptoms or have been confirmed COVID positive, that does not necessarily mean the entire district will shut down. If there are no cases in all other schools, it very well may mean that there is a cohort of students that are out in quarantine 14 days and having virtual school while everyone else is in session. Again, this is in coordination with the health department. They are wanting to prioritize keeping schools open when safe. So we almost look at each school as its own community of if they're in session or not. And that's why I really wanted to focus on the levels of the plan because it's easy to explain, well, why is it that every school except for school B is in yellow, but everyone else is in green? And we can, we can easily explain that through this model. So low to no spread, of course, I put green first because it should be our goal. It shouldn't be our goal at the expense of health and safety, but it should be our goal because of extra precautions of health and safety. So how do we establish and maintain communication with our local health department? And when there's low to no known active exposure at that school building, they would be in green. Minimal or moderate spread, this would mean that we're still, again, communicating with the health department officials, and there's active exposure at that school building, but it's minimal to moderate. This model will be enacted in coordination with the recommendations of the health department. If there's a confirmed case in one classroom, the contact tracing is key. That's why seating charts on the bus, in the cafeteria, all of that is so important because we have to be able to coordinate with the health department and tell them who that child has been around to the best of our knowledge because those students very well may end up quarantined. I understand that that is less than um, convenient. However, I want to assure everyone that in the event that that occurs, a cohort of students is quarantined, they will not lose instruction, they will be virtual. And that's why, again, every student has a device K-12. I'm really proud of our team for doing that and putting that in place. Um, and it will be important as we move forward. And then in substantial spread, that's saying we may have rolling closures. That's a terrible phrase, but it's something we need to be prepared for. It could be short term. It could be long term. Like we talked about, that may be our winter. We just don't know. Subsa substantial active exposure, cases and absences that are impacting building attendance, of employees, of our, of our students, and it will only be in place if 
recommended in coordination with the health department. It very well could be that in Portage Township, it's showing that we really need to be in red and all of our counterparts across the county are all in yellow. That very well may be. But again, it's, it's being responsive to the data instead of all of us shutting down at once when some communities or some districts may not be impacted. Any questions on this slide? So I think it's important to talk about that it takes all of us, and we know that, but you know, kids are very, very good about being able to meet our expectations when they know what the expectations are. So it's gonna be important that we continue to um, communicate with families and collaborate with them about what it means to send their child to school healthy and why should they stay home when they're sick or someone in their family is sick or they've been exposed to someone who's sick. Um, I know the board has wanted very much to prioritize the importance of not honoring perfect attendance because perfect attendance comes at the risk of someone coming to school ill. So we are no longer doing that. That is not a part of our plan any further. We are going to remove any of those perfect attendance awards because health is what's the priority. Um, and we want to make sure our buildings remain healthy places for our kids to learn. So I provided to you some of those recommendations of the CDC, of course, being socially distant, um, the cleaning and sanitizing protocols, hygiene of their hands, uh, facial coverings. We know that regardless of, um, of individual opinions of face coverings, when we're talking about 8,000 students, 1,400 employees, I would be irresponsible to recommend anything to this board other than required face coverings when social distancing cannot be achieved. I mean, this slide is the key to the whole plan working. And I don't know how we do it. We, I think you just got to keep hammering home to employees. Don't come to work sick. And the parents do not send your kids to school sick. The schools can stay open as long as we keep sick people out. Absolutely. And I think Another portion of this that's going to be really instrumental is now students also won't lag behind on their learning. Because I can think for myself where, you know, as a parent, you know, they, they're fever free, but maybe they're still really fatigued. And you're like, you know what, you've been home for three days, you've been fever free for the 24 hours. Let's try it today. Well, you know, maybe we don't. Maybe we do virtual today because now that's an option. They can get on and do virtual. I am not implying that virtual can come and go. You can pick and choose. No, we're not doing that. But in the event you need to stay home because you or someone you've been exposed to has had symptoms, then you can still be counted as present today. And that's important. Now, I'm going to have to work with what that looks like for state reporting because we don't know. We don't know. Right now, it's either you are present and physically in this building or you're not. So I don't know what's going to come down the pipe with that or how we're going to have to um, put that into power school. I'm not certain. But I think we need to look at what school means during a pandemic and a student's engagement while home because they're experiencing symptoms should not be considered in a punitive manner um, and, you know, sending out the attendance officer or sending. Um, well, we need to adjust our attendance policy. You're looking at it, and I think we need to bring that back and, and look at what that means. And again, specifically called out in the situation of a pandemic. Because if somebody's home sick, but they're still able to do their virtual learning, yes. it shouldn't really be counted as an absence. Correct. 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 Question. This is sure. for some clarification. Um, with regards to masks, so when they're required, and I think we all support that because I think we have a due diligence superintendent and we as the board to make sure we're doing everything possible we can to ensure the kids safety you've said that so you know, like in the high school middle school classrooms 25 30 kids uh, you know will they in class be wearing their masks the teachers wearing their masks okay so what has been recommended by dr stamp and supported um also at the state level with um, the health commissioner is that our student desks should be as far apart as, as physically possible. Now, please understand, I'm not implying that six foot distance is absolutely attainable. It's not, um, but we will have them spread out as far as we possibly can and a portion where the teacher is separate from our, from our students. And, and that's really hard as an educator to say because it is the opposite of what I know to be 
the best teaching practice. You want your teachers directly in the mix of it, in the thick of it, not that person on a stage, but involved in the, in the inner workings of what that lesson looks like. But for the sake of a pandemic, our kids need to all face the same direction, be as far apart as possible, and seat it. If the teacher is walking around the room for proximity, for management of the classroom or the learning, the teacher needs to be masked. If the students are working in a small group, we should try our best to keep them distanced, but they should be masked. If they're sitting individually, working independently, and there's not a large group discussion and a lot of conversation taking place, the recommendation is they can have their mask down. When by the teacher, okay, this is quiet, independent work time. Everyone's at their individual space. They're facing the front. They can have their mask down. Now, please understand that that's current today. Porter, Porter Health Department and the state of Indiana and the, the state health department. Could that change in our plan? It could. But as, at the current moment, if you're seated and as distant as we possibly can, and you're just doing independent work, not doing a bunch of conversation, you can have your mask down. When they're going to the restrooms, when they're entering the building, exiting the building, standing in line, they have to be masked. Dr. Stamp also was very specific on what it means to be exposed. And she said that when they're looking at contact tracing and um, I and Trustee Finley are in the lunch line standing next to each other and she's facing the front and I'm facing the front and we have our mask on and then I become COVID positive. They are saying for contact tracing, I should, it would mean that I was next to Trustee Finley for greater than 15 minutes, less than six feet apart and unmasked. So for the sake of standing next to her in a line to get my lunch, I'm okay but I do need to be masked. Um, so to answer your question, Trustee Williams, so long as the teacher feels like this is kind of a quiet, independent work time, everyone's more looking down, working on their work, and they're not sitting in small groups or anything, they can take the mask down, kind of like a breather. Any other questions on this one? I do think it's important to share our current statistics, and we'll make sure to continue to update these. And I, I added this today, so I apologize if you didn't see this portion of the slide, because I wanted it to be relevant to today's stats. So you'll see on the first um, chart there, total tests versus total positives. This is April 20th through July 2nd. And right there, you see in blue the total number tested, and it goes day by day by day and the total number positive. So in Porter County, if we were to go back to school Monday, because that's the first day of the school year, our plan would support going back in green based on Porter County statistics. Just the same new cases by day with a seven day rolling average. When I had shared with you the plan we had worked through the public work session, we were averaging three cases a day. We're now averaging 10 cases a day currently. So again, our plan would support that our students return with those additional enacted precautions in place. Now, I understand that things are changing. And so this is why my constant communication with all of you, with all of our families, and of course, Health officials is absolutely crucial because things can change day by day. And our families will need to understand as well as our employees that this can change day by day. We could come back and be in green and then be told you need to switch to red. There's no guarantee that we will just go up one tier. We just don't know. Our hope of course is that we stay in green. Our goal is always to have our kids in our buildings, but again, not at sacrificing the safety and health. Any questions here? This is just some guidance, and this I have an individual slide for each, each of these pieces further on, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on individual slides. I'm just going to kind of summarize it here for you. Our parents will be responsible for 
uh, going through that symptom checklist before their children come to school. So fever, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, chills, shaking with chills, muscle pains, headaches, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell. Um, the child or employee should stay home. Same thing if they're exposed to someone with any of those symptoms and they need to call our office. We'll put them virtual for that day. And, you know, of course, work with the health department and work with our um, our director of um, health in our district, Mrs. Olson, to determine those next steps. So then it gives you the next steps. So what about when you had a, a symptom and no COVID test? Because not everybody who has a symptom is gonna go get a test. So if they don't have a fever for 72 hours, let's say that you had the chills as an employee. Well, then you stay home. And then for 72 hours, if you've not had a fever without any fever reducing medications, you can return to work. Other symptoms have to improve. So if you did have the chills, you know, we need to know that you're not having those anymore. Um, in the event that you aren't improving, you will need to be symptom free for at least 10 days after your first symptom appeared. And then we very well may end up uh, requesting the testing. So then when you go into having system, uh, excuse me, symptom, at least one symptom and a negative test, you can't return. So if you, go, you, you leave school because you have a fever and grandma takes you to get a test, then you have to be fever free without any medications to reduce fever for 24 hours and provide the negative test to us. Uh, returning to school after symptom and a positive test. Again, it all comes down to making sure that we're notified at, at the school level so that we can then work with the health department as well. So if there's a symptom and a positive test um, and they've not had a fever, again, for 72 hours without the fever reducing medications, their symptoms have improved, at least 10 calendar days has passed, they can come back to work or school so long as they've had two negative tests 24 hours apart. Please be reminded that if there's a positive test, this is very well where then we are quarantining staff members who've been in, uh, directly in contact and students. Let's say this is the teacher. We might have a whole class quarantined if this teacher tests positive. What happens if a student is ill? This is going to, this COVID is going to collide with flu at some point yes. during the school year. They go get tested, they're negative, but they're still not feeling well. Is our recommendation still stay home? Yes. Our recommendation so I think still. We better make sure that's clear. Yes. Some people will say, well, they're tested, they're negative, he's just got a cold, we'll send them to school anyway. Yes. I think we better make sure okay. that's clear on that sure. as well. Sure. Um, and you may cover this later in your mind. Okay. I didn't that, so I thought about it. Let's say that teacher, it's not a you know, sickness, let's just say it's a car injury, you know, they get hurt. What about subs? You know, we have a plan for I mean, long-term subs or cohort subs at particular schools. So um, what we had decided this week was um, we are sending out through the mail our plan to all of our substitutes. And we are also sending them a survey. Um, I want some feedback from them. I want some input from them. Various districts are doing various things. I will tell you that I'm struggling because some of our long-term amazing guest teachers are not going to come back if they have to just go to one or two schools or be considered long-term out of it. Now, because of how we might have these closures or a teacher in quarantine or I'm, as you know, there's just not enough subs to begin with. But again, we're not looking at not keeping kids safe and not keeping employees safe. So I guess my answer to your question is I don't know yet how it's going to work. Um, I really need some input from subs, but I really need some input from how other districts are looking at that because that really start when we start looking here at when people might be out, that's when that question came to the forefront. Uh-oh, what about subs? And just to expand that thought process, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about medical staff, and we're talking about maintenance. Mm -hmm. So it's even looking at everyone just, at, you know, besides just the teaching 
right. support. So yeah, it's a heavy lift. Yes. There is. So yes, it's it's gonna be those unanswered questions are still really, really important. So I will be getting back to you on those. Um also, after you've had a symptom and a positive test, but you're asymptomatic. So 10 calendar days without symptoms, released by the healthcare provider or local health department. Dr. Stamp said they also can release individuals. They can return if they are approved to do so in writing by the healthcare provider or health department. Um, symptoms in your home. So they should remain home if someone in their home has any symptoms or is being tested until that test is returned and is negative or they themselves test and are negative. If someone is tested um, and positive due to that, whether it be an employee or a student, they should stay home for a minimum of two weeks and return to school after the documented infection um, has been cleared by the health department or the health care provider of their family member. Anything else there? So here are the three levels. And again, I want to make very clear that that we very well could um, be coming back at any one of these levels. It just depends as, as we're responsive to the data and responsible for making informed decisions. In the event that we can come back, of course, with plan A, saying that we do not have uh, even a moderate step spread within our school community, this would be traditional school year calendar, um, E-learning is available for those students and families who don't feel comfortable returning or those, those parents um, medically are stating their child cannot wear a mask. Those students will be strictly virtual. School buildings are open with additional cleaning and safety protocols in place and protective measures. We will have traditional schedules and technology will be used in the, individual, in the classroom and the individual tech device. So, um, you know, Trustee Maletta is, is one of our students in kindergarten. He's got his iPad. No one else uses his iPad. That's what goes home with him. That's what comes back with him. Now, I'm not implying that kindergartners will take those home every day, but they could if the teacher decided to do so. And then that's the device they take home in the event of a, of a closure. So in this, so we could, Ohio school could be in plan B and in yellow, while central elementary might be in green still. That's correct. That is correct. Each, each building is being in its own. Yes. We need Unless to. we get word from the health Unless department that get. says you're moving into plan B. Correct. C. correct. That's absolutely correct. And another reason why I think it's important to clearly define each of these levels, because we have to look at each level, quite honestly, even sometimes from the individual classroom standpoint. It's just going to really be, it's going to be intense, but it's, it's worth it to do our best to keep everyone healthy. Um, the hybrid schedule, I don't know if you recall, but originally I had a little different of a hybrid schedule. And after our work session, the board had provided some information or some input that I thought was really crucial and helpful. So instead, if they're group A, they'll go to school Monday, Tuesday. If they're group B, they'll go to school Thursday, Friday. Everyone will do e-learning on Wednesdays in the hybrid setting. So we can, um, again, have additional cleaning protocols before the second cohort comes instead of every other day, you know, uh, hybrid schedule A, then B, then A, then B. So I think that was really helpful. And I think that will be helpful to our teachers because they'll be able to collaborate on Wednesdays with their cohort of colleagues and plan for the following week on that virtual day. Um, and then plan C, we're saying that the community spread, we will stay there until it decreases and we can transition back to a hybrid schedule. Um, and then the school calendar year, again, is still right now what we're saying is going to be in place. We'll provide instruction from the teacher just like we did in the spring. It will be very similar with the exception of the feedback we've had because we have more time to prepare, such as giving additional assignments and extra time in between. We can do that now that we have the time to be prepared for those things. However, in, in the short term, notice of a closure because of cases this week and they say, okay, you're out virtual until... Well, that's going to take us a little bit of time to, to get our, our feet off the ground, but it won't lose in the instructional impact. But the long-term impact of parents getting several assignments a week at once, that's going to take a, a few minutes to get off the ground a few days. 
this was, I had broke down for each of you um, the various settings again when we looked at that overall approach of a wide lens. So in the teaching and learning of what is going to occur, um, you see what's going to happen in, in the in-person as well as the hybrid model and then the virtual schedule. Of course, daily screening of all staff and students we can't do if it's strictly virtual, but I think we still have a responsibility to communicate with our employees and our families that they should still be doing some of those screenings because it's important that they get the medical attention they need should they have any symptoms in their household. Uh, again, the student desk separated, instruction in the same room as much as possible with push-in services, um, PE and other classes, outdoors as much as possible, limiting interaction as much as possible. Um, if students are in small groups, they need to be masked. If they, uh, masks again are to be worn, if social distancing cannot be accomplished, we're limiting large group gatherings, we're discouraging congregation of students in large areas, um, designating areas to walk in order so that similar to what we've got on the grocery store floors. We're going to be doing some of those things. Cohorting kids so that we know exactly where they are. As you know, it's a little trickier with high school kids because they're taking a completely different course load than the students sitting next to them. Um, so that's something we need to also be uh, cautious of. Rotating classrooms, uh, desks are gonna be sanitized between every single student entering, uh, excuse me, leaving a classroom. Dr. Stamp said specifically, so if you have a high school social studies class, at the end of class, the teacher would give us each an individual sanitizing wipe. We would wipe down all surfaces. We're gonna have to show kids how to do this, that's okay. We'll show the kids how to do this. They would then throw away their own wipe, be sanitized right before leaving. So then the student that's coming to the desk the next class period is seated and has a clean space to work and that they will be responsible for the same procedures. So helping our kids um, be involved in this process, I think will help them with some of the ownership and, and the understanding that it takes us all. All, face, all desks, again, facing the same direction. The e-learning in that, in that virtual plan uh, on Wednesdays and then the group gatherings. I do have a question, actually a couple of questions related to the teaching and learning specifically, I'll just roll up to it. And it's regarding um, our students with IEPs and 504s, especially when we're talking about the learning and the, I heard you say push-in services, so that was the ding, 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 right? How are we going to make the um, accommodations for them, especially with speech therapy, occupational therapy, and everything else that they need to be successful during the day? So what we have looked at in our plan is, so if we are having a support model of push-in services in the classroom, the special education teacher, paraprofessionals, a lot of times the English language learners, it's a best, the best practice is to be pushed in as well. We will, we will hold true to those things. However, in the event that it is a student who's receiving direct instruction with um, an IEP that they need to be out for services or occupational therapy, physical therapy, whatever the case may be, they need to be pulled as a cohort so that those students receiving speech therapy will only receive speech therapy with those same students each and every time they go so that we don't have kids fluctuating in and out of those small groups, again, for contact tracing. So it's not going to be all the time that push-in services are possible. But what we need to be diligent about is it is possible and required that there are seating charts, that they are distanced as much as possible, and that they are always pulled with the same students. Do you have another question? No, that was, that was a good summary. Thank you. Do you have any idea how you're going to do lunches yet? We do. Okay. Um, so lunches are a trickier piece, as we all know. So large-scale rooms, such as gymnasiums, are likely, especially in the fall, to be uh, a satellite lunchroom. Uh, just the same in the elementary level as well. We are going to have kids um, that will rotate. So, for instance, uh, these two teachers on Monday and when are on Mondays. And Wednesdays, your kids are eating in the room. We'll provide the instructional support staff supervision, um, but they'll eat in the room, and then they will switch. And then the next couple of days, 
they will be in the cafeteria so that we minimize the number of kids in there. Again, using those common spaces, not as large group gathering spaces, but satellite spaces to provide a classroom to eat during that time in the media center or in the gymnasium. Maybe we can fit two classes. So we're going to have tables and chairs everywhere. Um, and our food service has been really on the ball and creative about it. I will tell you, we're doing grab and go breakfast. Uh, Teresa is really excited about this because it will more than likely boost our breakfast numbers as well because they will come in. There will be a, a, a train of, of uh, bags that then they go into their classroom and they're eating before the day begins because as you know, what happens for breakfast, everyone at once can't do that anymore. So now, as you know how I am about certain things, we're going to make sure it's not sticky and, you know, there are certain things we're not serving in the classrooms. Um, but we're going to make sure they still have things that they enjoy eating, but things that are a little less messy. Um, and then again, the sanitizing, the all those protocols in place, and our, our health, excuse me, our food service employees will then be in those areas helping to gather the trash and different things. So breakfast is actually a little easier because of that, um, but we will be really creative with what lunch looks like too. And it may very well be in the end that we end up saying that at least at the elementary level and possibly a strong majority at the middle level, we could say in your classroom. I don't know how we serve 2,400 students in the high school in the classroom. We're just going to have to be, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Thank you. That's the teaching and learning again. Um, and I'm thinking about the elementary and well, really all of the kids. Will students be able to enter the building to mass holding areas as we've done before the pandemic? Because parents would drop their kids off early and just have them in a holding and waiting pattern until school started, especially yeah. your elementary and your middle school students. So how are we going to address that? So no longer will that be. Okay. Um, the bus will be individually let off and they will go directly to their first class. One of the reasons that we did that holding pattern, which we, I, I personally, I plan on eliminating it going forward regardless. That holding pattern was for several reasons. One, as you stated, if, if a parent just needed to get them dropped off, but also because we didn't always unload the bus if not everybody was going into breakfast. If you weren't going into breakfast, you stayed on the bus for about an extra 10 minutes. We're not doing that anymore. Everyone's going directly to the classroom where they have the option to breakfast or not but regardless now they're in class so those holding uh patterns especially our middle schools are really good about about making making sure that kids get to a a location where they're held until um now they're going to go straight into their classrooms and that's where we're going to be even a little more flexible in needing to understand what those start times are for schools um We'll be releasing those, but there are going to be some changes. Our middle schoolers will now start at the same time because our high school, um, our high school routes, everyone will need to drive one so that we can minimize the number of kids on those routes. And so high school will actually start after middle school. We know the research supports that. I believe, um, and don't quote me exactly on the time frames yet, but middle school will start somewhere around 720, 725. And the high school will start around 750, 755. So again, I think it's the right thing to do. If we're going to make changes because there's a pandemic, we might as well look at what educational research says is best. And it says high school kids need sleep. So um, we're going to make those adjustments. And we will communicate those as well. But um, individual families that typically were dropping off before and uh, you know, just wanting their child to kind of we can't, we just can't anymore because we don't have the, the supervision prior to those times that drop off is permissible. We don't have the supervision to ensure the safety, the social distancing, it's just, it's just not possible anymore. And then one more question related to teaching and learning and if PE and music are two favorite classes and there's a lot of sweat happening and the instruments with, you know, music, what does that look like for teaching and learning next year? So for our PE classes, we're going to suspend equipment at this point in time. And PE class is going to be um, really unique in, in you know, that personal space. And we might be doing something, but everybody 
is is doing it on their own. So whether it be um, we're pretending to run a 5K and that teacher has something displayed up on the board virtually and we're all standing there doing our little run and our little progress. Um, they can also, and I've seen this done and, and it's been really a creative approach at Bigley and Willow Creek in particular, I've seen it, where those kids then bring their iPads to class and they're doing an individualized, personalized virtual game um, with something that they were able to select based on level of interest and it's seated on the floor. Now, of course, you got to be careful about breakage, but it's on the floor and the kid's watching that and, you know, doing something with whatever. So it's going to be interesting. I think that the, we're going to have to look to those national organizations and the memberships our PE teachers have to say, what's the new way to uh, teach um, being physically fit in this time and age? Um, and as far as music, we have been um, advised by Dr. Stamp that anyone who is singing has to be masked. They have to be masked. Um, but I haven't solved the issue of wind instruments yet. Yeah. I've got a lot of really smart people around me that need to help me with that. And Mr. Timberman's at the top of my list and has been no, right. regular emails as of late. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> But isn't it interesting because you just can't think of it all. There's so much. There's so much. There's so much. There's so much. But I know that those are immediate questions that I know that oh, yeah. parents are asking, especially about the PEs. And it's just Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple questions. Would you have preferred that I wait till the end of the presentation? Okay. Just... If, are they related to this? Or... Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So um, when children do go home because they are ill, then the teachers would have to have two plans. So one plan would be for you know, learning in the classroom. And then are they then required then to have a separate plan for the e-learning as well? Same teacher with the same group? They will be responsible for both. Um, I will tell you that over the, over the years now, um, year five here, within my current seat. And my team has been really, really dedicated to the, the concepts of personalized learning because our kids need to be targeted at their individual, independent level and instructional level. We have intuitive programs that coordinate with our WIDA programs as well as our um, NWEA so that kids get instructed at their individual and independent level. That's going to be crucial to utilize those intuitive programs on these days that a child is virtual quarantine experience and symptoms so that we are responsive to the students' instructional needs and we have programs that allow us to do that because as you, I know, are thinking in your mind, if I've got Johnny, Jimmy, and Jamie out on quarantine, how am I going to how am I keeping kids learning the same concepts? And so a lot of our training for the teachers before they return is going to be utilize those personalized learning digital resources as a regular piece of your classroom platform, which a lot of them already do, because when they go out, you're going to need them to still be on track and monitored, and that's the best way they can do it. So then at the individual buildings, would the principal or building administrator be required to give parents a weekly update, a daily update? You know, you have children going home and their parents are asking, maybe, will be asking them, are there any kids that are sick? Or did they go home because they you know, have a virus or because they had a doctor, uh, dentist appointment or whatever? How how are you going to, or have you, are you, is that something that you're going to do? We are working on it. But I want to streamline things as far as, um, you know, that has remained a, a commitment within the district about how communication gets out. So, of course, Mrs. Evers Lowey will be directly involved in what that communication looks like. We will have form letters. So, what occurs is then each week, as principals update, and I would say weekly, unless that, unless there is a positive case, or then we're gonna whether it's the time of the week that we communicated or not, we're going to communicate it.
because we don't want to wait till a Friday to communicate that we had a positive case on Tuesday. That's just not, that's not a good thing. Um, because again, that comes back to being open and transparent with that. But other than that, we will then communicate once a week. We will have a format that is, is going to be developed by Mrs. Deepers Lowy in coordination then with Mrs. Olson and um, and probably Mr. Wilson and then myself because we're, you know, we're trying to streamline who's doing what. And then that communication will go out to the families that week and everyone will be used to what that communication looks like, but it will be specific to that child's building. So as a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa, you might get three of those letters because you've got three kids at different schools, but at least they're all going to be the same type of information, same format, just different information based on the individual building. And then I will make sure that that information gets to you weekly. Do they need to hire like an additional like nurse, nursing assistants or yes. other full staff? So at this time, um, the plan I intend to bring before the board, and I did share this just briefly with the finance committee yesterday, and this will be included in our CARE Act's money, which in your update that I provided today, that you've not had a chance to see it because it was right before I came here, uh, we, we have about 1.1 million, correct, Mrs. Williams? Okay. So with that money, some of that is going to be additional personnel. And I don't have a fancy name for calling them what I plan to call them because I'm not sure yet, but we're hiring sanitizers at every single building that will be going throughout the day, all the touch points, nonstop, all day long. That is their sole job, both inside and outside. So each time as kids get off the playground, when they get on the playground, they're sanitizing beforehand. Then they're playing, then they're getting off the playground, sanitizing before going in. Then before the next group can come out, all those touch points are sanitized by our sanitizing specialist people. Um, just the same, it's important to me and not something that I think is going to be widespread, but again, I want to commend the board for this. Because of our fiscal health in this district, and because of whether we have CARES Act dollars or not, the health of our rainy day fund, I am going to be um, hiring an additional health assistant per building. I want a wellness health assistant who is strictly for daily medications, uh, checking blood sugar, ice packs, I, he got my thumb backwards. That will be in place. But then we will also have for symptoms, a different health assistant in a different location so that there is no crossing of students who are just coming down because they need their inhaler or because they have symptoms. Um, and that's a, a real strong priority. Now, do I think long-term Again, we're in a pandemic. I can't guarantee how long we need two health assistants at elementaries um, and just the same at, at, at Willow Creek and at Fagley and at the high school. And I'm not confident that that's only going to be one. It might be, I don't, I don't know. We're going to start everywhere with an additional one and a separate room. Um, but so, yes, we're, we are hiring additional personnel 100%. Now, I also am not confident that that's the only additional personnel. I just know off the top of my head, those two are absolute crucial. Uh, and I don't foresee us just hiring one person for sanitizing purposes per building. Of course, at this building, I, I'm, I'm looking at 15 to 20. Um, at the elementary, at, we're looking at least two, I would assume. Um, so we're going to need... Those grandmas coming out of retirement, if they feel comfortable coming to sanitize all day. Those PTO moms who want to want to come while their kids are in session. I mean, I'm fine with people saying, and I'm applying, and I'd like to be at Christmas because that's where my kids go. I mean, whatever it takes. But again, I think that people will also gravitate toward it because it, it's taking care of our kids in our school community. And I think that people want to know what they can do to help. And we'll pay them for it. So would you consider at the district level hiring someone that would be considered a let's say safety specialist? Because it sounds like we're gonna have reports and we're just gonna have so much that the current staff that you have in the central uh, office might it might be overwhelming. So I have looked at that. Um nothing definitive as of yet. If anything, I would like it to be an additional health professional um, who would work alongside uh, Mrs. Olson. And maybe that's kind of where that veers off, where she
takes care of clinics in the traditional capacity that she's always, and maybe we have an additional person who works alongside central office specific to COVID and um, symptoms and the health assistants who are strictly dealing with those who are symptomatic, both, both students and employees. So that is something I think that we need to look at as well, because you're right. Um, everyone that we have in place is working at capacity prior to a pandemic. Anything else so far? Okay. So protective measures, we talked through some of these, of course, hygiene, um, hand washing, covering coughs, all of that. Uh, the proper way to remove a mask, the proper way to clean their mask. We will be giving them to start off two reusable masks um, so that they can have one to wash and one to wear. Um, and I know that uh, with, and I believe I shared with, with the board, um, President Maletta had shared a suggestion and Mrs. Devers Lowey has then since worked with Amy Parker with the EDC. And that suggestion was kind of a pack for all kids so that they have uh, the ability to be responsible for their contribution of what it means to be healthy. So it would be hand sanitizer. It would be those masks, uh, possibly an individual thermometer um, that they, they can take their temperature before coming to school. Um, we're throwing around the concept because we want them to be able to have water. As you know, water fountains are shut down. But we're trying to decide, is a reusable water bottle better or um, having water available in this format? Because, again, we can control the hygiene of the bottle. Um, and what happens when everyone's bottle looks the same and, you know, can the teacher each morning put the initials on the top of one like that? So we're, we're trying to decide what's the best approach to that. But I think that that was a really good cue because the more we can help every person be responsible for their hygiene, the better off everyone's going to be. Um, of course, the signs frequent washing of hands, constant breaks to wash hands. Again, as I said, breaks from the mask. We need that in place. Um, expecting our students and our employees to wear a mask for seven and a half, eight hours a day, that's just, that's really difficult at, at best. Um, playgrounds will be open during the green phase, but if we do go to the hybrid phase, we're not going outside to the playground because that means we've had some, some, um, uh, positive cases in that building and we're gonna just shut down that playground concept. Um, if they feel sick, we will isolate them for their symptoms. Again, that's where they will go to the symptomatic room um, and our reporting process in place to communicate with all of you, communicate with families and the health department. Is there some discussion before, would there be any additional like hand washing stations or do we feel we have enough of the restroom and bathroom we have? So, um, Additional hand washing stations, no, but additional sanitizing stations, yes. We're going to have um, Mr. Matarovich, as you know, who does a great job with buildings and grounds. He has been ordering, ordering, ordering. Um, we're working with some other options um, that we've had some leads on, but we will have those everywhere. Yes. And as you may or may not know, at the elementary, every classroom has a sink and soap. But again, in those settings, the touch points are a little trickier to be managing, whereas I've got those people sanitizing the bathrooms that we're going to be going around all day. So for me, the best option is to have the hand sanitizer on demand at all times in the teacher's classrooms. So that will not only be in the form of mounted to the wall and stations of hand sanitizer that are also mobile to get out to the playgrounds and that, but also in the just the individual big bottles that we're just going to have everywhere. Um, the concept of vulnerable populations, I assure you that this is going to continue to unfold as well because I think we're going to need more input and feedback from those that this, that this directly uh, relates to. So I think it's important, again, that we are prioritizing hygiene for everyone and the masks for everyone because we have students who are vulnerable and we have staff who are vulnerable and that's that is an obligation we have to all of our employees and students but also checking in regularly with those vulnerable populations with the parents with the employees with the student individually themselves um, to make sure that we have those regular check-ins 
also transitioning early. So if we have a student who is vulnerable and the parent and the healthcare provider still feel like with the precautions we put in place, that child is well enough to attend school, we very well may have them doing passing periods at opposing times to the other students. We may have uh, their meal brought to them individually into a different setting um, that is an even smaller uh, cohort of their couple close friends or similar kind of what we've done in the past with allergies, uh, just on a larger scale of, of checking in and making sure we're, we're considering all of those things. Um, I think it's important to be responsive at the individual level for the vulnerable populations. And so it's hard to give you the ins and outs of what that's going to look like because I think we really need to look at the individual needs of those employee groups, uh, those individual employees and our students. Um, cleaning and sanitizing, we talked about the additional stations for sanitizing, the routine cleaning. We've had the foggers for a few years now. They work very well. We have, were able to keep our flu numbers down tremendously since keeping the foggers. Um, emergency cleaning protocols in place as well as additional supplemental protocols in place. Um, the evacuation plans in alignment with, of course, uh, the health department if we did need to close the length of time it would take to, to deep clean. Um, and then, of course, making sure that you're aware, the families are aware, and that we're responsive in the approach so that we, if it's a classroom that needs to be shut down, if it's a whole hallway, it's just hard to say what it's going to look like. Any questions on that? Extracurricular and co-curricular. At this point in time, I've recommended and plan to um, make sure that we carry this out. At the elementary level, I would like any clubs to be virtual. Reason being, keeping our students after school at a time where there's less supervision and not as many people to be able to do the additional protocols of sanitizing and knowing that we need to get the building ready for the next day. We really want to limit or eliminate the amount of traffic in the buildings after hours. Um, would I like to revisit that at a later date? Yes, but for this point in time, those will strictly be virtual. I don't want to discontinue clubs. I just want them to go virtual. I mean, we, we've had, as you know, the, the virtual enrichment camps that have been uh, a hit this summer. We've had the STEM champs camp with Mr. Pasquale that's been a hit this summer. Um, kids are enjoying it. So do I think gardening club can happen virtually? I'm sure it can. We've got creative people all over the place. So um, we're just going to do that at the elementary level to uh, eliminate the amount of, of individuals after hours. Also, it's important to mention that transportation is strongly going to be um, a concern at the middle level for our activity buses. I don't know if I can have activity buses right now for the middle school ECAs and sports. I just don't know. Um, is it my intention? 100%. I need to look more at what those routes are looking like. It's unfolding every day. We've got a lot of good feedback from parents. About 40% are not going to use daily transportation at this time. However, we still have to minimize the loads of those buses. And in order to do that, that means longer routes. That means more people taking routes that normally maybe they only they didn't do a high school route so they could get back sooner to do a uh, a co-curricular extra, or excuse me, activity bus. So I just don't have the answer for that right now. Uh, you know, transportation made me think of this, the Evergreen Project the city's doing. Do uh, you have a timeline when that's supposed to be done, do you know, by chance? I do not, not at this time. Okay. So we have more parents dropping off, especially at Willow Creek Middle School, and that's not necessarily done the traffic nightmare yes. that will be. Okay. Yes. And I, I know that you. plan was drawn up and approved for the next couple of years as well. So you're just finally now getting the work done. It was it was at that time scheduled before it was be finished before school would start. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. assuming that probably is still the case. It is. That is still the case. Okay, good. Good. Um, but I will tell you we're also gonna work real closely with um police because we are going to have to redefine all traffic plans because we're just going to make the assumption we're going to have to assume everyone is transporting at some point in time so the traffic flow plans we very well may end up with staggered plans so if you've got a sixth and an eighth grader 
you think are you dropping off at the sixth grade time or the eighth grade time and if you've got solely an eighth grader you know you're coming in this 15 minute window i mean it's 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 going to be difficult at best um some of our flows for traffic lend themselves better to being able to do that and like you said bullet creek middle school that's just not one of them that has the easiest flow Two questions. Um, you said something about the bus drivers. Are we increasing their hours by chance because of our demand and our need? That's one question. It is a strong possibility. Okay. okay. And then my second question relates to facilities because I think we need to talk about this out loud too. Will school facilities be reopened for public use in the evening, especially when you think about the field house and people like to go in there and walk around and do their exercises in the morning and sometimes in the evening? So. At this time, I directed my team that we will not have any outside facilities for community or organizations in, in Portage Township. And again, that's something I want to continue to monitor. I don't want that indefinitely, but it's indefinite at this time because by the time that those areas are cleaned, we need to ensure that they're clean and ready to go for the next morning for our kids and there's no contamination. And so in order to do that, Having our facilities used by others is just not wise. And also something I ha had um, this is our check with our insurance provider. At this time, they are not suggesting our facilities to be used by others because we just can't control who's coming in, if they're doing the daily symptom checks, um, if they're social distancing and using protocols. And so we very well may put our school community at risk for something that we have no control over. And we were going to just the same now with the governor's um, executive order of stage 4.5. That again shuts down outdoor facility use as well. So transporting students, this one is is um, something that again we're asking parents to partner with us as is everyone in the county to encourage them to transport their students to and from school again about 40 percent said that they plan to do that we've been clear or excuse me we will be clear that students are required to be masked on the bus that's not an exception and of all the, all recommendations this was the recommendation that was spoke of for the length the longest amount of time because you surely can't ensure dis social distancing on a bus but to be practical, it's sometimes the only way a student can get to school. So they will need to be masked whenever possible. We will have the windows open to allow some additional airflow. Um, they will be in assigned seats and that will not change. So again, for contact tracing. Um, bus drivers wearing masks. That's gonna be an interesting piece that still continues to unfold. During loading and unloading, they will be masked. At one point, there was guidance that we could put plexiglass behind the driver. That has since been revoked. Um, so, and then also there's considerations about should they be masked while trying to drive? And I don't know the answer to that yet, nor what the guidance is going to be on that. So, but they will be for certain masked while loading and unloading. And then we're waiting for further guidance from the state transportation department on what they're going to recommend. Um, the actual driving. So um, when a child is leaving the bus and let's say the bus driver hears that child coughing and look, appears to be ill, would that bus driver then contact the school nurse or the principal immediately to let them know? Just go in Absolutely. So all employees will be trained on recognizing and, and looking for symptoms. And similar to when we have a child, quite honestly, who vomits on a bus, they instantly radio to the base and the base instantly calls our office. So what we will probably more than likely do is devise a, um, a way of calling to the uh, transportation department that allows them to know that someone on the bus may be symptomatic. And then what will happen is the health assistant and or principal will then meet the driver at that bus, which is what we do now if the child gets ill on the bus and learn who's the child that's symptomatic and, and get them immediately isolated from any peers and staff. 
Um, buses will be cleaned and disinfected between every single route. We're not doing field trips at this time, and I assure you that when I do consider field trips, it will be on a very limited basis and case-by-case -case basis. For instance, when we do open uh, field trips, it will probably be such as Mighty Acorns to Imagination Glen. It's outdoors. It's local. We know what the current cases are in our area. Um, Out-of-state field trips, I'm not even considering any possibility of that at this time and have no indication of when that would be or, or if, if that will be at all this year. Um, but at this time, no field trips. Again, I also have to determine how we're going to handle transportation to be able to determine if we can even have the capacity of field trips. As we talked about, if a driver isn't comfortable coming back and the guidance is that they only let's say mask during loading and unloading, there are drivers that will say, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't come back then. So we don't know what our return rate will be based on what unfolds in the next few weeks. So field trips right now are on, on hold. However, I'm gonna strongly encourage and, and my team will strongly encourage virtual field trips at this time. I mean, we don't want to miss out on the learning, but we just have to find a different way to bring the outside in. Students will be washing their hands upon uh, entering the bus and exiting the bus, as well as as soon as they enter the school building. At drop-off and pick-up, parents and guardians are to remain in their vehicles. And uh, again, they will sanitize their hands. So parents aren't going to be coming in and out. Um, now, if a parent chooses to walk their child to school, they can be by the exterior door awaiting their child to exit the door. But again, we're going to encourage and have signs that they should also be socially distant. Meals. So again, washing hands at all times, um, wearing masks when not socially distant, except when eating. And again, we're going to limit the capacity in the class, or excuse me, in the cafeterias and have those satellite options for where students can eat. And of course, we will have some mobile serving stations. We're in the process of also ordering those um, hot boxes and different things so that we can still provide students with a hot lunch. However, um, the idea of offer versus serve, you know, we normally have the choice of green beans, corn, and mashed potatoes, let's just say. Well, it very well may be now that we've got green beans because we are going to individually cut everything and that, you know, we're going to have a few options, but we're not, we've always prided ourselves in a wide variety of options. And right now that's just not feasible. The other reason is, again, being fiscally responsible, share tables is currently halted. So if it, we cannot allow them to put their banana up for somebody else to grab. And also the sharing of those things that aren't in containers with uh, the food bank or the food pantry are also strictly prohibited. So in order to minimize waste, I also want to minimize the number of choices. We will have hot choices and cold choices, but it won't be, you know, three hot choices, two cold choices. We're just, we're going to have to flip flop. And of course, our food service team is very responsive as well to the data. We're not taking away the things they love. You know, they're going to have those things, but maybe some of those items that they, they kind of are hit or miss, those might be off the menu for now. Again, these are just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. This was just a larger slide of each of those ones I showed you at the beginning. So if you have a positive test, how long do you need to stay out? If you were out with a fever and a negative test, um, I want you to know, though, that what's going to happen is we need to uh, make sure, you know how I am about high reliability schools, in order to be viable, these have to turn into a form letter in power school. So if a parent calls and says, my child had a fever, she was tested or he was tested and the test is negative. We then go in and find a letter that says fever, negative test, and it generates your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa are the next steps. And we can email that to the parent so that we're not going, oh, wait, what was it that we do in the event of a positive test in the house or symptoms in the house? So each one of these will, again, the no COVID test, what do you do? 
The COVID test negative and a symptom, what do you do? The test positive and asymptomatic, what do you do? These are all going to be generated by Mrs. Olson. Now, these, again, were reviewed and approved by the health department, local and state. Um, but our, our step beyond that is to then put them into power school. So nobody's having to generate the conversation with any employee or parent of what the next step is. We know the next step. It's going to send that information straight um, out to us in an email, to the parent in the email, to the to the uh, classroom teacher. Now, I'm not implying that it generates it automatically to an email. What I'm saying is the form letter is generated automatically. We're going to have to copy and paste it into an email. I'm not saying that it takes away all manpower because that's not the case. But I might suggest, I know uh, Dr. Ostrowski is our board physician. Maybe have him review all of these Yes. As well, just to make sure that the protocols are correct. Absolutely. I will make that happen. Yep. Um, so, again, this one has a positive test of someone in the home, what to do, what if they're being tested. So, all those same ones. But I, I like that idea. So, I will make sure when I review our minutes that I'll get that to happen. Any questions up to that point? So, as you could imagine, um, sending this out to parents, it's a lot of information to digest. And so I thought um, when trying to develop this, how do we communicate and say, what can you expect in these various scenarios, kind of like positive behavior interventions? If they know what to expect in the different environments, they can better be prepared to educate themselves, educate their child, and make an informed decision if they want their child to be in person or virtual. So we kind of devised the whole a day in the life of a PTS student if I send my child back to in-person learning. So again, these are the symptom checks that the parent will complete in the morning and a list of the symptoms. And that if anyone or the student in the household is experiencing symptoms, they should absolutely contact the school and may be excluded for 14 days. Transportation to and from school. What if I drive, walk, or bike with my kid? We are encouraging this. If they walk or bike, bring students by car, or carpool if desired. One thing that I noticed that some families have shared with us, they've kind of cohorted the, or quarantined with a sister family that they're close with. So maybe you decide to carpool with that family. I don't want to out and out say carpool because, again, that is, you know, contact tracing needed as well. But if there are families who have kind of opened up to seeing each other and, and keeping others distant, I think that's a good option for some of those families. Um, we will allow them to walk the student to the outermost door of the building entrance if they walk. I need to clarify that because if they drive their child, they stay in the car. What if I have my child use the school bus? Again, distancing six feet apart. We always want to be honest about this. It's not possible on a school bus. They will be required to mask, drop off, and pick up times may possibly be staggered. Every school district experiences longer times for transporting students to and from school at the start of the, start of the school year. We can expect that to only increase right now. It's just not going to be possible to get what might have been a typical route of one bus might be two buses now. And if we have drivers out or drivers who decide that this is no longer for them, and we, then it might take two routes and a person going back to get the second. We just don't know. Um, but communication is going to be key so those families know what to expect. Um, what if they, uh, this happens in elementary, I think a lot, like one kid wants to ride home with another kid at the end of the day, you know, parent might have to sign off on that, but that's the school allowed or? So at this point in time, although I don't like my answer for it, it's the, the answer I feel most responsible with, the answer is going to have to be no right now sure. because when we're talking about contact tracing, I'm fearful that I might unintentionally miss that a child should have been quarantined or had possible exposure because the one time seven days ago that they wrote home with Jimmy. So it, it's tricky. Now, I'm not saying that we can't continue to revisit that, but right now for the start of the year, I'm going to say we're not going to allow the extra home with somebody else because I, a lot of times, a lot of times it just, 
it can be too cool of a situation sure. for us to control. I'm sure there are probably a bunch of parents watching. And Absolutely. I'm, I'm grateful for the question because then what happens is these questions that you guys are asking, they need to become questions and answers on our frequently asked question document because that question, I guarantee you, there are a zillion parents that have that question and they rather know the answer to that now than when they have to work a double and don't have that answer and call the school and say, can my kid? They rather know that now. So I appreciate that. Um, I wanted them to know that we will make sure that everything's cleaned and disinfected between routes at the start and the end of the day. Smaller routes prioritized when possible. They will be assigned seats, attendance on the bus, and windows open during transport whenever possible. Before and after school care, this is kind of still that big question mark. I have a meeting with Shannon Burhans from the YMCA um, early next week to discuss what we're going to do with those um, students who are Y care. Are we still going to have it at the buildings? Are we transporting to that? If we are, and if we have the capacity to do that, that will need to be a separate route. Normally, it's this route small for the day, so they're going to go with bus 14, but maybe next week, they're going with bus 67. So we We've got a plan for that. Um, Mr. Wilson worked with the Boys and Girls Club on some planning, and so we're still in the process of what that looks like. If our goal is to transport to those child care facilities like Ma's Little Champs and that. Again, it comes down to family. And we're going to make every effort to make that answer a yes, but we've got a lot more strategy and planning to be able to figure that out. Are you going to include them in the meeting process? Of the will. Okay. Mm -hmm. At some he point will. Right now, now we're, do, we're going to work YMCA and work with okay. the girls club because that's that strict, um, that's a lot of a lot of our kids even beyond elementary. Um, so we're going to start there because a strong majority of our after school care are those two places. So we're starting there and then going to branch that out. Arriving at school, what can my child expect and how can I help prepare them? Uh, they will wear masks as they enter the building. Social distancing is going to be a priority. Areas where kids normally congregate, you know, the commons at Portage High School. We're not going to be able to do that now. Um, those areas will be restricted. And as Trustee Finley asked, what happens in those holding areas in the morning? They don't exist anymore. They will go directly to their classrooms. Upon arrival to school, they will wash and sanitize hands. What can we expect during the school day? Teachers and staff will receive training on signs and symptoms of COVID, social distancing, masks when they can't be distanced, areas of congregations again restricted, alcohol-based sanitizers available, scheduled times determined throughout the day to have regularly scheduled washing and sanitizing of hands. The sharing of school supplies will be limited um, as much as possible. Student desks will be arranged at a distant the, excuse me, at a distance to the extent possible. We'll repurpose large spaces for possible classroom usage and or lunchroom and outdoor spaces utilized whenever, whenever weather permits us to do so. I am excited because one of my favorite learning environments in a school is the courtyard. And I think the courtyard is going to be a hop in place for teachers to sign up and be able to take their kids to. So. Recess, playground equipment cleaned and sanitized daily for touch points and again in between those sessions. Um, recess will be staggered throughout the day to accommodate our students at the elementary level and students will wash and sanitize both before and after. Breakfast is grab and go and they will eat in their designated area or classroom. For lunch, they will be staggered to minimize the number of students eating at once and large areas repurposed to accommodate lunch periods as need be. Technology is something I think that is also important because, again, we're planning for various scenarios of the plan and the tier system of the plan. So, again, very proud of our team for the one-to-one -one technology that's been in place, K-12. to um, All students will be assigned their individual device that's strictly utilized by that designated student. The technology um, for 6 to 12 will remain in place as the iPad. The elementary, we already have in place the one-to-one -one devices, and it's K, 1, and 2 receive iPads, 3, 4, and 5 are Chromebooks. We do have a large amount of Chromebooks that are kind of shared between disciplines at the secondary level. We can do some of that sharing. However, um, we're going to have to have additional 
updating protocols in place in the event that any English class needs to use Chromebooks over iPads uh, and what that looks like. So, and, and secondary students, I have faith that they could properly clean all of those things before and then again sanitize before and after. Um, in the event that distance learning is necessary, whether it be on a short-term or long-term virtual basis, they will have those devices to take home. I believe I shared this with you at the end of the school year, but how we normally collect devices at the end of the year is important to our team, but we didn't. We allowed those devices to go home, and throughout the summer, we will uh, prompt students and plan to prompt students to access those online um, online challenges that we're putting in place to get out to study island and do this and do that. Um, each school is kind of devising that and will be communicated out. We wanted them to keep them home this summer, but what does that mean? They're not gonna be prepared for the fall because we have to redo the profile for the following grade level, get the device cleaned back up as far as um, what what's accessible if they're moving from fifth grade to sixth grade. Um, also, if there's any breakage. so. Because of that, when we first get back to school, I'm actually really excited that for at least two weeks, we're going to be device free. And I think everyone is going to enjoy that. Let's focus on helping keep each other healthy and safe. Let's focus on building relationships. What what we missed about school, what we love about school, celebrating the face-to-face -face conversation and learning. So um, that will be a little challenging the first couple weeks but I think we'll be welcomed by educators and students alike to just get put the device to the side and get back to relationships for a bit. So speaking of starting in the school year, I don't see open houses, welcome back to school nights and all those so we are looking, we are still going to do the orientation of sixth grade and ninth graders, and it's going to be staggered because we feel like when you're coming into a new school, the importance of being able to walk your schedule and learn that, but it's it's going to look different. We are going to have virtual back to school nights, and I'm also planning with the team, I haven't shared this with them yet, but virtual parent teacher conferences. I think that's, again, because we also have vulnerable populations within our families, and um, my goal is going to be 100% because everyone's kind of starting to get used to this virtual thing. Um, and if we have the MiFi at home for those who don't have access, that will help with that as well. So as much as we can capitalize on the virtual open houses and the virtual conferences with parents to include IEP and 504 conferences right now, to limit as much as possible the traffic in our buildings, we're going to do that. Um, this this slide is talking about that schedule again, the in-person, unless otherwise needing to move to hybrid or the virtual schedule. I want to mention to the board that in the event that a parent chooses for their child to be on the virtual option, they're committing to that for a semester. Um, I think that's important for the continuity of the classroom, the continuity of instruction for the teacher, the classroom consistency for the students. Uh, it's it's a commitment, and so that's something that we want to get this information out well in advance for parents to weigh those options, including those parents who who have, for one reason or another, or medically decided that their child isn't going to mask. If you're not going to mask, you're committing to a semester minimally of virtual school, and then if we still are masking second semester, you're committing to another semester of virtual school. And I want to be clear with that because I don't want to mislead our families to think that a medical note saying my child can't be masked means that your child comes back unmasked. That is not going to be appropriate. Um, both options, however, do allow for traditional grading practices, daily and weekly instruction, individual assignments, and they will still have their technology device high quality instruction, and I think it's important to mention by our certified teachers. So if you pick the virtual option, it is still going to be delivered by our, our very own certified teachers. Those teachers very well may be those that are fragile or have a fragile child of their own. Um, so does that mean some might be, need more training than others? Absolutely. But I think they've proven and the feedback from families have proven that our teachers rose to that challenge and will support them through that as they, as they figured out. I don't know if we're gonna need more virtual teachers than just those populations. We might in that event. What I intend to do is post those positions like we would, let's say a summer school position, if you would like to apply to be a virtual teacher. 
for the pandemic. But we'll have to see how that looks. Yes. What's the window? I know you stated that we're going to ask families if they want to attend and participate virtually. What's the window for them to make that decision? Have you decided yet? You know what? That is going to be heavy on our list next week. Okay. That's real heavy on our list next week because I also want them to have the time to digest the plan. Okay. Um, there's a short video that I made today. Uh, Mrs. Lowey already put together the letter um, in the event that this plan is approved. To, to explain to the parents the two options and what you're signing up for if you want them to be in as traditional a setting as we're allowed to come back in or if you're strictly going virtual, you're committing to the semester. Um, so letting them have a little bit of time to digest that and then I would like to say no greater than I think two weeks is a hefty amount of time, but might be the amount of time they need to digest everything, but probably no longer than a two-week window because we also need to accommodate who's going to be doing that. And of course, our teachers, in all fairness, need the time if they're going to be virtual to develop what their plan is going to look like. Thank you. And then for a day in life, what the end of the day looks like. Dismissal times will be staggered for social distancing. Masks will be worn, schools will have procedures, and those will be individualized, of course, based on the size of the school, the number of students in the school, um, for buses, parent pickup, and car riders. But of course, we're not going to not do the precautions that are standard in the district, but it very well may mean that at um, Kyle, parent pickup is before buses, but then at Jones, buses, and then parent pickup. It just depends on how that flow of traffic and the traffic plan kind of unfolds and the number of parents they have that are picking up. So that will be a little more individualized but clearly communicated. And then parents are not going to be entering the building at the end of the dismissal day. We typically have this already because of security, obviously. We don't just have the doors open for that to occur. Um, I do want to add that the original plan was that there would be kind of like a drop box area. If you had to drop something off to your child, you'd, you'd ring the bell and you'd leave it at the corridor. Dr. Stamp said, you don't have to do that. They can come in and hand you the lunch box and leave. It's okay. So, because again, we also want to be as conscientious of the relationship with the family as we all know is equally important. We don't want this to, to be treated as if the parent is the virus. But at the same time, we want to be responsible in that limitation of who's in and out long term. But if they're just dropping something off, they can absolutely come in. If they're picking their child up at the middle of the day, they can come in and then we'll send them back out um, and walk their child to them. But if it's just at the end of the day, I want to wait in the corridor, we're not going to do that. Yes. Before we go on to the next um, part, I love that the process is mapped out for in-person instruction. Is there an opportunity for us to do something similar for virtual learning to say these are the things you should expect as a virtual student yes. so that parents that will have a plan? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, when you see that decision-making model that I sent you guys in the Excel sheet that is at the end, um, you'll see there's the last page on those um, tabs at the bottom is virtual and it's red and it's blank. Okay. Because we need to figure that out, but I want I wanted the input of the surveys, and I wanted um, the teachers who will be doing that to be able to help devise what that plan looks like. Because I'm fearful of getting ahead of myself and thinking I, that my team and I can figure that out, and then we've done it wrong. For instance, I didn't even anticipate parents telling us, I'd love to have a week's worth of information at one time. So that obviously is going to inform the plan better than I would have been able to. So that will be forthcoming. That, that is extremely underdeveloped at this time. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Technology support, school access of Wi-Fi. I think it's still important to mention because the board had prioritized this in the past that we have the property line to property line. Because sometimes, you know, um, it's just nice to be able to have that in the event that the ball fields do open up on our on our grounds and um, you're doing virtual because you have a child who's uh, medically fragile but your other child isn't and they're playing 
playing baseball and you're in the car with the other child and they're on virtually, that's great. Um, again, prioritizing the MyFi hotspots um, so that, that we have that support in place for those who, who are um, needing that. And we, have, we will be doing some additional surveying of that, not only digital surveying, but also looking back at what our data was telling us about those kids who were not engaged. For whatever reason, I can tell you, I uh, was tagging along with Mrs. Caballero to families that were not engaged. We one day uh, masked up and got in her vehicle and we're knocking on doors. A lot of times it was, oh, well, he's been in the room all day. He told me he was doing his e-learning and apparently he wasn't. But sometimes it was, we don't have access. So we're going to use that data as well. Um, student devices, again, K-2, to two iPads, 3-5 to five Chromebooks, and 6-12 to 12 iPads. And again, that IT help desk parents have really enjoyed having because they are very responsive to their needs, and that will take place at all stages of the plan as well. I know all of you are wanting to know how we're going to address gaps in learning uh, because they're going to exist, and um, we are determined to address them. So even if in the event we had to start in red, we are going to be working with our partners um, for those standardized district-wide assessments that we use to see how we could at all possibly administer those at home. Now, I understand that there's concern that if we're testing at WEA to find out where the student's instructional level is and where their gaps are and where their strengths are, that, that we need to educate the parents, hey, let them do this on their own. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting with them during e-learning and they're going to have content above their head instead of where they really are. So helping them understand when it's a prescriptive task that we want them to do on their own compared to something different. Because again, that personalized learning path is going to be created based on what the child knows, understands, and is able to do. So that will help us with identifying learning, learning gaps from the spring closure and what are those learning uh, targets and priority standards that we need to backtrack, not only for all students because they weren't in session in the same capacity, but just because of the learning loss that happens in the summer uh, or that the content just wasn't able to be gotten to as, as well as we would have had they been in session. So we will also identify the areas of strength at the current grade level and those areas of need. We don't want to just have a one-size-fits-all instructional model, more so than ever before. Um, Conferencing with students for their upcoming benchmarks, where they at, again, kids rise to the expectations much more when they know uh, what the expectations are, where, I'm, where I have strengths and where I have areas to grow. Our common formative and summative assessments focused on our curriculum maps that are standard-based, the learning targets, the I can statements, our priority standards are going to be extremely important to address those gaps. Um, and then our ongoing feedback to students and spiraling of content for, for making sure they're able to master the learning and maintain it. It's kind of like that preventative maintenance with a vehicle compared to uh, replacing a tire. You know, what are we doing to make sure all those things are addressed? And again, data is our best friend. So ongoing monitoring of their progress and collaboration with their teachers. Um, this is nothing new in education, nor is it anything new to Portage Township Schools and our concept with high reliability schools. Um, but it, again, just more than ever is going to be crucial because there is not a one size fits all, depending on what these students have opportunities um, with and exposure to during this time based on equity, based on, um, you know, two parents that were essential workers and not able to help and kind of had to leave the student to their own devices to do the best they could. So it's just, it's going to be important. Something I always want to make sure we focus on, and again, what Dr. Box had mentioned, the mental health needs, making sure we are having those school-based preventative um, interventions that are universal for all kids, as well as those um, at-risk students and their targeted interventions. Um, I'm really proud that even during that spring semester, when we went out, the targeted interventions still took place. Those virtual sessions with their counselors still took place to include those with our community-based, um, school-based counseling with Porter Stark Crown Counseling. Those things were still in place and will continue to be. This is the document that I shared with you that will continue to be updated, where we're going to talk about, again, adding those, the ones about 
riding home with Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. <laughs> um, so this is, again, just that document that says I'm pretty confident I, I've gotten through these, but I'll just gloss over them. We talked about masks being required when we can't be distanced. We talked about providing the masks to employees and students and regularly cleaned at home. Uh, at this time, no field trips, but when they do resume, it will be a case-by-case -case basis. The virtual school will be our certified teachers, and they'll be responsible for the students enrolled in that setting for a minimum of a semester at a time so that we have continuity. Uh, if they attend the virtual option, can they participate in extracurricular and co-curricular activities? And the answer is yes. Um, the Department of Education, the High School Athletic Association, and ISMA all are in, a, a, in agreement with that, and it's the right thing to do. They are our students. They're just attending in a different way. When do I choose between in-person and virtual? This is going to um, be a question that we further enhance the answer so that they have the timeline of when that's going to occur. What if my student cannot wear a mask? If they cannot wear a mask due to any reason, they'll need to enroll as a virtual student. Um, anyone in the in-person model will be required to wear a mask at various times. And this is in direct alignment with recommendations of the health department. I think that's important to, to state. What happens if there's a confirmed case? We'll communicate with the health department, get their guidance. We may be closing for a brief time to clean and disinfect. Confidentiality will be maintained as far as who that individual is, employees, students, names, all of that. But the duration of the closer, closing, the impact, and the rationale for the closing will be provided. What happens if someone's infected? And this, again, goes through the 72 hours, symptoms improving. A uh, note from medical professional or medical provider or health department. Uh, what if they're awaiting a test? We've answered that. What about the attendance policy? So we will revisit those attendance policies, but I also mentioned that attending school sick is strictly prohibited, prohibited and we are not going to award perfect attendance. We will revisit and I will pull those policies out so that we can talk further about if my child attends virtual because they're ill for the day what's the proper reporting for that to the state and how can that not be punitive? Um, and maybe we don't have the answer for that and for the state, it's still an absence, but it's something that's an understanding and in our policy that for the sake of learning, virtual is considered an attendance for the sake of local. Will visitors be permitted in the buildings at this time? No, minimizing the contact for students and employees with those outside. Um, We'll try to provide opportunities to have meetings by appointment and whenever possible virtual conferences, parent-teacher conferences and case conferences. The intermittent distance learning. I just want to continue to reiterate that everyone must prepare that cultures are possible and likely. Uh, this will only take place when state and local officials work collectively together. You'll be directly involved in that um, as well. And when that occurs, we need to remember that primarily it's used in the basis of a school closure and local health officials involved. Our teachers will teach their own class if it's the teachers who aren't always virtual. Instructions will include live uh, meetings and in small group, large group, as well as independent work. Lessons will be redesigned and enhanced based on the feedback from the survey. Um, high quality, standard-based instruction, again, a priority, and equitable access is an absolute priority. The last slide is the school plan that you've seen and is in attached in board docs and that decision-making model chart that not only shows each of the levels with the check marks like we went through, but then individually. And I think it's important when we move to a new level. Let's say we come back green and then instantly we jump to red. It is important to send out to the employees and the families just the red chart. So that then they're not looking, nothing else at that point matters other than red. Or nothing else at that point matters other than yellow if that's where we are. So that we can have those readily available. That's it? <laughs> that's it. Yeah, one question. Porter County Director Carissa, right? Since he's here, can we ask him a question? Sure. Okay. Um, just the continuity for your plans at your center, because I know that parents are asking about what's going to happen at the Porter County Career Center as well. And since you're here, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Are you yes. still going to have your programs? What does that look like? <laughs> 
as confusing as it is at the district level here, it is that much more confusing for us. We have been in constant communication with the superintendents here in Porter County, but the cool part about us is we don't just service Porter County, we also have students from over high school that come. So there is just a little bit of collaboration going on right now and just a little bit of stress going on in our world. <laughs> and we're getting information from each of the districts and looking at their plans and figuring out how that makes one big happy plan for us. Okay, because I know that they're asking about that as well. Yes. And it's going to need to be, Thank you. it's still a cohort as well. So they're gonna be in a cohort when they're at the Career Center or in our programs throughout the county. And it's going to be important that then we know, and we've talked with our principals across the county and, of course, in Hobart as well, and we'll continue to work with the Career Center on this because then another layer, just like we don't want students going home with others right now, the contact tracing, if you're involved in a CTE program, and then come back to the high school in which you attend full-time, we're going to need to know and and keep very close tabs so that if Hobart has a situation in a CTE class, that we're all aware. Now, the good news is this. We have these types of conversations all the time. There are times that we went into a lockdown situation unrelated to anything going on in our schools, but something in the community. So we're in a lockdown situation. We're calling every high school principal to say, you're in a lockdown, don't send your kids for this program. Keep them at your building or turn the bus around. Go back to, you know, so those things do happen, but it's even going to be obviously more crucial as all of it unfolds because the contact tracing. Thank you. Nobody answered any questions. Okay. Nobody has any further questions at this time. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the back to school plan for the 2020 2021 we have a motion and a second um any further discussion i guess probably for those watching this this will work even tonight could change mm -hmm. the day from now you know just, just yes yeah, i think that's the yes. most important thing yes. the reason we can say right now this is the plan today as everybody knows if you i mean what you're watching is really correct. Yes. This is a very fluid situation. It'll yes. probably continue to be throughout the school year, yeah. frankly. So I think we just, yeah, this is the plan today. It could change. And this um, is the perfect example. If we were to start school tomorrow, we would be green. However, that could change by the middle of next week and definitely within two weeks after the 4th of July. So this is exactly the practice we need to be aware of and and prioritize that communication with our families because we we have the plan but the stage of the plan between now and august 12th and august 25th and so on is going to be we stay to lock us down again or they can absolutely all wide open yes the question that then i mean so let's say in two weeks from now we need to change this plan come back and vote on you know, another board meeting or Based on the information you get, I mean, we're, that's the decision we're going I think, with. I, I believe, I believe the governor's order allows you the flexibility to make the changes in the plan. The only thing I would say, and I think this is important, really throughout as this plan unfolds and it's changes, and as we get to school, communication is going to be the key. You know, rumor mills fly out there all over the place. Somebody, so I just think it's going to be real important. Every detail has to be communicated. Certainly any suspected cases or anything we need to immediately let the parents know yes. um we can't there's nothing to be swept under the rug or any delay in that communication because we don't want people to get into a panic we want them to, to trust that they're getting all the information that they need and that uh certainly the kids and our our, our staffs um help them that best interests are at heart right. so and it might be so suggest as you as you approve the plan i guess to clarify I'm not asking that you approve that we're in stage green. Okay. I'm asking that you approve that we will be responsive to the data and we will be in one of those three no, stages. Yes. Okay, I, I don't want to say that we're we're approving stage green, and I apologize if that's the way I 
made it sound. You're approving that there are three stages of the plan and it is fluid. And if we were to return tomorrow, let's just not even think about what color we're in. We'd look at the data, we'd work with the health department and we'd say, okay, everybody, this stage. Yeah. So again, to clarify, the plan we're approving has all three yes. stages. Yes. So uh, the determination of what stage you're in happens irregardless. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, absolutely. Any other comments? I'll make one before we bring it to the vote. Thank you. I know you've worked really hard. I know the team that you've been working with, um, the other superintendents. I know some of the school systems have copied our plan already and have introduced it. And that's a kudos to you and your leadership. Um, this is not easy. Uh, we all recognize that. Um, and again, to everyone who had a, a piece of this, um, thank you for really, this is very well done. Um, and also um, to, our, to our parents, I know hopefully a lot of you are watching um, or will tune into this and they'll get this plan. Make sure you take the time to read it carefully, slowly, understand it, and go. Is there an opportunity? People have questions. I mean, what, what would that process be? Because people will have some questions as they read this. I mean, even though it's, it's, it's spelled out very well, but they'll, they'll still have some questions. Is there a process or something we could recommend that they do? So, I know you're going to try to answer some of those with the FAQ. Right. My thought is um, I would like to see that parents have been really responsive that whenever they have questions that aren't specifically building related, related, and I would say this is not, this is more district related, um, to email PTS communications. Because what happens then is we can answer that person directly and then add that question to our list. And then at this time, I'm almost thinking we need to each week, kind of like what the state's doing, we've added these additional questions and answers based on more information, based on additional questions we've received, um, and they can just email that email link directly. And we'll make sure to put that in the in the email that's going to the parents this evening. This evening they're going to receive a copy of the plan, a letter from me of if they're in person, here are the items that will be in place. And then we will say, and should you have further questions along the way, email here. Because I don't want to unintentionally lose anyone's question. And right now email is the best because not everybody's back. So calling an office and leaving a message, you might not get a return call on us. So I guess my plea out there to the parents that are tuned in or will watch this is if you have a question, go that route. Don't ask your friends on Facebook that question um, because you'll probably get the wrong answer or you'll get multiple answers with confusion. So um, direct questions here. Um, and if there are good questions that come up, we may want to publish some of those, no. maybe on, on a frequent basis. And these are some questions that came through, yes. and here's the answers. And make sure that the whole community has an opportunity to, to get those answers. Thank you, Megan. Something you said. I also want to commend you and your staff for what is a lot of work and actually very easy to understand. It takes a little bit of time to read it, um, but it's it's hard work that went into it. So thanks. Well, I don't think I've ever given you a 64. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a motion. We have a second. Can I make a comment? Yes, you can. Um, I'd like to say that I have a lot of confidence in you and the team, and I do have a lot of confidence in all the educators and the support staff that they are going to be the best that they can. Um, I know there are a lot of people that are nervous. The staff and, and us, um, but I think together we can. I think if there's one thing to take away, it's that we got to take care of each other. Yes. And I just want to say, too, kudos. I mean, following up with what Wilma just stated, you guys have done a really good job of thinking through a lot of the pieces and the puzzles and having to come together as a whole community, county, plus adding other communities in as well is a challenge. So Good job to everyone. I'm excited for the teachers. I'm excited for the parents. I'm excited for the uh, students because they do miss each other. <laughs> so that possibility that they can come back together to be able to socialize and get what they really need to be able to continue to grow is very important. That's why we do the work that we do. So one other item I had before you vote uh -huh. is I just think that the community also needs to be aware of the level of commitment of this board because our next meeting was not scheduled until July 13th. And this board prioritized getting this plan 
established and out so that we were not having families and employees sitting and waiting. And again, the rumors just because people, our natural instinct as humans is when the answers are unclear, we have to formulate an answer. We aren't comfortable with just letting things sit out there unknown. So you prioritize being here. Um, and I want you to know my team would have been here. I told them do not cancel their vacations because today was not a work day for them. Um, so that's why many of them obviously aren't here. But um, I just want to thank you because putting this meeting together, we said last Friday, let's not make our community wait. And I appreciate that you did that because, again, now we're talking about two weeks notice greater than what they would have expected when we thought originally we weren't going to get notice from the state until after the 4th. So we're, we're ahead. Trustee Williams? Yes. Trustee Mileta? Yes. Trustee Vasquez? Yes. Trustee Phil? Yes. Okay, our next item on the agenda is item 2.02, .02, approval of policy for masks. So um, I think we have shared enough that masks will be part of our return to school plan. Um, but I also want to share with you that the requirement of this policy is because we also um, are receiving masks for our students from the governor. And so in order to receive those masks, which we're extremely appreciative of, they are costly, um, we have to have a policy of how we will utilize the masks, in what way um, they will be utilized, and of course, in the event that we did request the masks that were offered, they in some way, shape, or form were going to need to be required. And the use of the mask in this policy is consistent with the plan we just approved. That's correct. We have a motion to approve the policy for masks. I'll make a motion to approve the policy for masks. Second. Move to the second. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. Trustee Williams? Yes. Trustee Yes. Trustee Williams? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to others. Anybody have anything else to discuss that's not on the agenda this evening? Um, did we get any public comment for us? I don't believe so. Uh, we do have a slew of upcoming meetings. Um, again, thank you to this board. You're working. This this is proof we have a very hard working board. And I know it's hard to coordinate all this. And Cindy, thank you for your patience on trying to get all of our schedules together for all of this. Uh, one thing I do want to announce, I am sad she's not here this evening, um, which is a, a cause for a couple of these extra meetings is a board member uh, Mary Clancy um, sent a letter of resignation from the board this week. Uh, the good news is she bought a home and she's moving. She'll still be in the district, but she moved out of her represented district. Uh, so by statute, she had to resign from the board. So her last day will be July 11th. Um, we will not have another meeting uh, with her uh, with that. So we do have flowers and I uh, just publicly want to thank her for her time on this board. She worked uh, very hard on it. She was a, a great contributor. Uh, a very, it was nice to have a young, fresh perspective on the board, which she did bring to us. Um, with that said, uh, I believe it should be on our website now. Um, there, we have an open position, so anyone who lives in District 2, uh, which you can also find those boundaries on our website. Briefly, I believe it's north of the... Uh, Newland Trail, uh, is, that the, is that the trail it is? Yeah. yeah, in south of the railroad tracks, but whatever. In that district, it spans across the city. Anyone who lives in that district um, can apply, and uh, we'll be conducting interviews after our meeting on July 13th and be selecting a new board member on the 15th uh, for that replacement. We, we did really rush that in a little bit. Because there's so many decisions that need to be made as we move forward, we felt that we wouldn't leave that position vacant very long. So, uh, thank you, Mary. If you're out there somewhere, uh, we appreciate everything you've done with the board, and we will miss you. Anybody have anything else? If not, meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.